Hi students, welcome to HSC Earth and Environmental Science and Module 7 on Climate Science. In this, the second video, we're going to have a little bit of a look at the relationship between climate variation and the super cycles. Our learning intention for this video is that you use secondary sources to assess the different causes of natural climate variation and the timescales in which these changes occur, including the plate tectonic super cycle. Now we've looked at the plate tectonic super cycle before and we know that the past is the key to the present. That's the quote that we've uh, referred to previously by Charles Lyell and it's one of the things that we've based our principles of uniformity and our understanding of the geological processes that we see happening in the present. And we've done some extrapolation back to the past and tried to understand um, how these sorts of processes were occurring in the past, what evidence there is for some of these similar geological processes to have been occurring, uh, and what we can conclude about what may happen. Of course, the most important thing that we need to remember about all of this is we're going to be doing some modelling and we're also going to be looking at seeing what sort of natural processes are in place that have an impact on some of these important greenhouse gases that we're going to be talking about, but also the impact that human activity has had so that we've got a baseline. And at the moment, that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to get our baseline. The climate change is a complex concept. It's one of these things that doesn't have a very simple answer. And that's one of the reasons why we've started looking at this entire module from the basis of both political disagreement and also scientific disagreement. We need to make sure we know where the facts are. We need to know who to listen to, um, who to read, uh, who to get our information from. We need to understand that there are a lot of ways in which this concept is oversimplified uh, or, or simply misunderstood. So what we want to try and do is firstly we want to have a look back. We want to start um, by our understanding of the present and the future by seeing what has happened in the past. So that means we need to try and have some idea about what the climate may have been like um, on a past Earth and also to see if we can uh, get at how that climate might have changed over time. What sort of natural processes can occur that may actually have allowed the climate to go through these different periods of change uh, over different periods of time. So remember too, we're looking at modelling, we're also looking at time scales. And time scales, as you'll see, are going to be incredibly important because one of the things that has uh, created some concern amongst the scientific community about climate change is not that certain things are happening. Certain things are happening that have happened in the past. The concerning thing is the rate at which they're happening, the speed with which certain things are changing, the consequence of some of those changes, and how rapid the impacts of each of those are. But that's getting the story a little bit ahead. So let's go back a little bit and let's review what we've understood about tectonic forces and how they contribute to energy transfers in both the atmosphere and the hydrosphere because they're going to be very, very important. Earth and Environmental Science in Focus textbook it has a nice uh, little visual here of some of the ways we can interpret the global carbon cycle. Now these are enormously large numbers and so they were a little bit difficult to try and get your head around when you just quickly glance at this. Um, a couple of important things, of course, it's always useful when we have these sorts of diagrams that we have a key and a key really tells us some nice information about what's going on. So we've got R's for respiration and P's for photosynthesis. We know these are two very important processes that are going to contribute to uh, carbon dioxide levels, oxygen levels in the atmosphere and also uh, in the hydrosphere as a result of the presence of different types of organisms carrying out these very important biological processes. But we know that there's certain activities too that uh, may be contributing uh, in a significant way to changes that might be occurring in the levels of these important gases. The other thing that we want to try and do, and we know that the biological systems are ones that we've looked at for some period of time, we're going to need to look at the oceans. We're going to need to see what's happening at the surface and what's happening in the deeper oceans. The fact that if there are 
temperature changes that are occurring in the oceans, is that a normal process? Is that affecting the cycling of nutrients, the cycling of material, the cycling of energy from uh, deep to shallow or shallow to deep waters? And how does that impact on the organisms that are on the land? And of course, we also have talked about those processes of interaction at plate boundaries. So at subduction zones, what are happening? Uh, volcanic eruptions, what's going on there when we have volcanoes erupting as a result of perhaps subduction zones, perhaps because of um, hotspot volcanism. There's a couple of different places where we can kind of see that there's a number of different activities that are all going to have an impact on the global carbon cycle. But when we start to talk about the long-term carbon cycle, when we start to think about, okay, what's been going on over very, very large time frames, then we can start to think about these super cycles. We can start to think about the fact that the tectonic super cycles that we've talked about have around about a 400 to 450 million year um, time span. So this is the um, construction of a single supercontinent surrounded by a massive ocean, and then the breakup of that supercontinent into a number of smaller fragments, and then the returning of those fragments back to another supercontinent. Now, those have changed over time. There's been a, a number of different types of supercontinents that we've talked about in previous parts of this course. What we do know is that there does seem to be a link between um, the way that the waters and the air moves when we have one single very large continent, one supercontinent like Pangaea or Rodinia, and when we have lots and lots of different um, smaller fragmented con uh, continents surrounded by a number of different oceans. We can link what we see here to things like um, one supercontinent with a massive ocean is often associated with lower carbon dioxide levels and ice house uh, climates. Now, this means an increase in um, glaciation. Basically, if we talk about the cryosphere and the parts of the Earth that are icy and cold, then we get an expansion in the cryosphere when we get these ice house conditions. And certainly, um, we've talked about, uh, for example, snowball Earth, as one example where the, um, the, the climate got very, very cold. And so the, the, the ice caps, the glaciers extended much further away from the poles uh, than they had in the past. And they're also going to come down the mountains. So we know that uh, for a snow-capped mountain, that, that line of snow, if you like, uh, is going to change as the, as the climate changes. And so it's going to rise further up the mountain when it gets warmer, and it's going to come further down the mountain um, as the climate is getting cooler. We know that the reverse of that is also the case, so that when the continents are separated and we have a number of oceans that are kind of breaking that up, there's a, a movement of material through um, each of those oceans, cycling uh, material from the uh, and, and energy, of course, from the surface waters to the deep water, deep oceans and back again. We do know that does take a long time as well, though. So where changes occur, and a lot of this has to do um, with the specific heat capacity differences, really, between air and water. So how quickly um, the air heats up or cools down, loses its heat, transfers its heat, um, and how quickly that happens in the water. And I'm sure you'd be aware, um, particularly those of you who surf regularly, would know that the water is much harder to heat up, um, takes a long time to heat up, but it holds its heat much better as well. So therefore, it takes a long time to cool down. So temperature variations in the oceans are much uh, lower than they are on land. And the air over the land warms up um, a lot more, particularly in the summer months, cools down a lot more uh, particularly in the winter months. But we can still even see some quite um, large-scale variations in minimum and maximum temperatures within a single day uh, on land. That doesn't tend to be the same sort of case uh, in the ocean. So what we then need to do is we need to say, well, what sort of activities are contributing to long-term carbon cycling, to this shifting between the ice house climates and the greenhouse climates, between very cold conditions and very warm conditions, and 
what sort of uh, scales are we looking at here? So when we're doing these cyclings um, of average um, global temperatures, what sort of variations are we looking at? Are we looking at a couple of degrees difference between um, an, an ice house climate and a greenhouse climate? Are we looking at tens of degrees difference between each of these? And this is one of the things that we need to do when we start to analyze some secondary sources. And that's definitely one of the things that we're gonna need to be doing uh, during class time. We need to make sure that we get lots and lots of secondary sources, start to sift through these. We introduced those last, uh, in the last video through those books. Um, they're great sources of information and they allow us to start to piece together some of these uh, important aspects of what is going on. A diagram like this, again, this one comes from your um, Nelson uh, focus textbook and you can see when we start to go through this if we look at some of the ways in which certain activities contribute to the carbon cycle over time we can start to get a, a sense of exactly how many types of um, activities that are related to plate tectonics uh, can then be uh, important in cycling material around. One thing that I will point out, I guess, before we move on, and we're gonna look at this in a little bit more detail when we talk about oceans, is that we classically um, consider carbon as being uh, carbon dioxide. So, so when we talk about problems with the greenhouse, uh, greenhouse effect and greenhouse gases, and in fact, carbon dioxide is not the worst, um, but we'll, we'll look at that later on. Um, but we kind of get fixated with carbon dioxide and when we burn stuff we release carbon dioxide and um, and when we breathe out we release carbon dioxide and when we cut the trees down there's not enough carbon dioxide coming out for the process of photosynthesis and so on but carbon is uh, carbon is in a lot of different places it's particularly important in living things um, it it's the main constituent of all of those really important biomolecules uh, like carbohydrates, proteins, lipids or fats, and nucleic acids. But it's also in a lot of the important skeletal structures that we find for a lot of invertebrates, the shells, the corals. These are often carbonate compounds and therefore, again, um, are very much sensitive to levels of carbon dioxide, not necessarily just in the atmosphere, but dissolved in um, ocean water, for example. And if those levels change, if the acidity changes, then we can have some quite um, significant impacts happening on these types of organisms, and therefore, uh, again, a flow-on effect to what's happening to atmospheric carbon dioxide. So this is a big story. And it's one of the things that we will need to continue to consider as we uh, progress through. But remember, at the moment, we're trying to set our baselines. We're trying to understand what are some of the natural cycles that have impacted on the climate in the past. And certainly one of the important ones that has are the plate tectonic super cycles around time frames of 400 million years. So these are very slow processes. They take a long time but they do um, definitely show us some changes occurring uh, in the climate as a result of these natural processes. Thanks for watching.